Hi, this is Miranda Wright, and this is day 37 of our 120-day Upper Room Prayer Campaign. And today we're going to pray, Lord, purify your bride. In the Old Testament, we read a story of when Abraham was looking for a bride for his son. And in this, can we see the perfect picture and representation of God's searching for the bride of Christ? Abraham was a wealthy man with vast resources and servants. And so he called his faithful servant and sent him forth to go and retrieve a bride for his son. This servant was a representation of the Holy Spirit, for it is the Holy Spirit's job to present us as a pure bride unto Christ. And so the servant of Abraham goes seeking for the bride. Therefore does he seek the Lord for who he should bring back to his master's son. At this point, we're given a list of criteria that gives us a picture of the kind of bride that God approves of for his son. So that when the servant of Abraham arrives, he finds Rebekah waiting at the well. When he comes to the well, she offers to draw water for him and for all of his camels. Now, my friend, let me explain something to you. It's not like turning on a faucet. Water is very heavy to draw up bucket by bucket and camels drink a lot of water. Therefore, did she spend a lot of laboring time drawing up that water from the well? The water, of course, representing the word of the living God and the well representing those deep wells of living water that spring up when we come to the Lord in that place of prayer and seeking and intimacy that causes the Holy Spirit to be stirred up and drawn forth out of us. She was found waiting at the well and then was willing to labor to draw all of that water up and pass it out to those who were dry and thirsty and in need thereof. The word says that she was a virgin, she was pure, she was chaste, she was waiting for a husband. She was humble and selfless and had a servant's heart. Once she agreed to the engagement and was purchased from her father, which was the tradition of the time that a bride would be bought with a price, paid to the father of the bride, she was brought to meet her new husband, and the Bible says that she covered herself with a veil. She was modest. She was veiled. She was chaste. She was not showy. And though she had never met him or seen him, she made herself ready to be married to him. In eager anticipation, she put on her best for him. She was a woman of faith. And so in this do we see the perfect representation of the true bride of Christ. And so we're going to look a little more closely at each one of these points as we see what it takes to truly become the bride of Christ. Because yes, Jesus came and he suffered and died and he shed his blood that we might be cleansed and receive the infilling of his spirit and walk in authority and power in his stead, that we might do the work of the kingdom even now. But the word says that that's not where it ends. He's coming back again and he's coming back for a pure and spotless bride. And the word of God tells us, oh bride, make yourself ready. Be sure that you are ready when he returns because you don't know when it will be. And so today we have to see what is required of the bride of Christ. The first trait that we see in Rebecca is that when Abraham's servant showed up, she was found waiting at the well. She was there drawing that water, tending to flocks, tending to others. And so as the bride of Christ, God expects us to be waiting for him at his return. According to scripture, we are to live every day as though he could return this day. Because if we do not, then we will be caught unaware and unprepared and unready for our groom. In Luke twelve thirty six, it says, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also for the son of man cometh at an hour when ye think it not 
children of God, he is coming back, but he's going to come at a time that is least expected. Therefore, must we live ready every day, no compromise, not having our hearts set on the things of this world, but set on him and things eternal, not trying to build for ourselves a place a home in this world, but living with eager anticipation for the home that is being built for us in the world to come. We are not going to stay in this house, but we are going to be brought with our bridegroom to a house that he has prepared for us, a house not made by hands. He will carry his bride away unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we will reside with him forever if we are prepared at his coming. So my friend, make sure that when he comes, you are found waiting at the well. And of course, the well in scripture represents the place where the living waters reside deep within you that Jesus said is the Holy Spirit. When we draw up the waters of that deep well, we are drawing up, stirring up the Holy Spirit. We are getting that word and revelation and having that communion with the Holy Spirit of the living God. We are spending that time with him. We are abiding. We are learning. We are growing. We are drawing it up and out and then ministering it unto to others because when Rebecca drew that water up it was to water the sheep it was to water God's flock therefore friend when he returns let him find you spending time seeking the Lord in prayer that you might draw up the words of the Lord and the revelation of the Holy Spirit that you might then administer it to others among the flock be found waiting at the well We see this same principle laid out in Jesus's parable of the 10 virgins in that there were 10 virgins that were waiting for the bridegroom to come and recognize that these are virgins. They are pure. They are faithful. They are not adulterous. They belong in this wedding and they all had oil lamps and a flame burning in each. But five were foolish and five were wise in that five let their oil burn out. They didn't go out into the world and partake of the sins thereof. They didn't cheat. They weren't adulterous. They just let their fire go out. There was no oil. Because you see in the Old Testament, the oil again represented the Holy Spirit and specifically the anointing. And so in the Old Testament temple of which all of the relics were replicas of New Testament realities, we see that the candlestick which represented the Holy Spirit was actually an oil lamp and it had to be trimmed twice a day. Oil had to be added twice a day that the oil not allowed to run out. Therefore, when he says that five let the oil run out, it means they weren't tending to the fire. They weren't refilling the oil and so we see the same principle they were not waiting at the well they were not stirring up and drawing up that power of the holy spirit they weren't abiding they weren't communing they weren't refilling their lamp with the oil of the holy spirit and so the fire burned out my friends you've got to get in his presence every day in fact i like to use the example of the old testament temple and where it says twice a day that at least twice a day you need to set aside some time to spend with the lord to read your word to pray to worship to seek his face to be refilled to connect with the holy spirit and have that oil replenished so that the fire continuously burns bright because when the bridegroom came they all ran out And the five foolish who had let their fire burn out began to cry to the five wise who had continuously trimmed their lamp and said, give us of your oil that we might go in unto the marriage supper. And the five wise said, no, it is not so, for we would not have enough for ourselves. But go to that place where you get the oil and see if you can get some. But there was not time. Because that they could not rebuild their relationship. They could not rebuild that fire quickly enough. It was too late. The bridegroom had already come. So my friend, to be found the bride of Christ, don't let your fire burn out. Don't run out of oil. Be found waiting at the well and continuously drawing thereof. You must commune, you must abide in that place of prayer. And so the second characteristic that we see about Rachel is that it says she was a virgin in which represents purity, faithfulness, that she was true and committed, not entertaining other lovers, that she was spotless as the bride ought to be because we know that the Bible says that Jesus is coming back for a pure and spotless 
bride, no mixture, no mingling, no compromise. In 2 Corinthians eleven twelve, the Holy Spirit spoke through Paul and said these words to the bride. He said, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, in other words, I'm afraid for you that you might be deceived by subtle and cunning words, just like Eve was deceived by the serpent, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is Christ. That you might not be obedient to the word of Christ, faithful to Christ. So then that he finds the need to warn them. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, I'm afraid that you might would accept it. In other words, the Holy Spirit was speaking to the bride through Paul and he was saying, it is my job to present you to Christ blameless and spotless. But there are those who will come in and they will try to lure you away and cause you to lose your purity or faithfulness to Christ, causing you to cheat on him and have your garments spotted. And they will do it by preaching to you another Jesus that is not the same Jesus that we have taught you. My friend, there is a Jesus out in the world that is being preached that is not the Jesus of the Bible. That's why you have to learn how to seek the Lord for yourself. Open up the word and say, Holy Spirit, teach me. It is your job to present me blameless and spotless before my Lord as a chaste and pure and faithful bride. And I am trusting you with my life to teach me the truth because I want to be pure. I want to be white. I want to be found the bride of Christ. There is another Jesus being preached. There is another gospel. There is another spirit that is a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit through Paul is warning the bride of this. And he's saying it's subtle. It's very cunning. And I believe that you could be led astray by it just like Eve was. So I'm telling you to learn the word of God and learn how to seek him for yourself. Because if you follow men, then eventually one of these is going to enter into your flock and lead you astray into the error of Balaam. Because Jesus said that there is a doctrine of Balaam that works within the church whose purpose is to put spots on the bride, that it is a spot on your marriage feast. And we know that the scripture says that some we must save by fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. There are gospels that will claim to be the gospel of Jesus that are anything but that will incite you to indulge your flesh, causing your garments to be spotted as you move out of right standing with God and obedience to his will and word. It will cause you not to abide and not be counted among the bride of Christ. Jesus gives us a parable of God being like a king who was putting on a marriage for his son. And so he sends his servant out to go out into the streets and invite all in to the wedding who would come. Didn't matter their, their background, whether they were good or they were bad, they were all given an invitation. Yet once they came, there was a man who was there who did not have on a wedding garment. And when the king saw it, he said, how dare you come in here without a wedding garment? Now, granted, all had been invited, but yet not all were chosen. In fact, this parable is where the verse comes from that many are called, but few are chosen because all had been called to the marriage supper of the lamb but not all were chosen to enter in because this man came in without a wedding garment therefore we're all given the invitation but only those with wedding garments were allowed to come in so what is this wedding garment in revelations 19 verse 7 we see exactly what it is when it says let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come 
and his wife hath made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white and the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints and he saith unto me write blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb and he saith unto me these are the true sayings of god therefore the word of god makes it clear without any need for interpretation that the wedding garment is the righteousness of the saints therefore are many called unto the marriage supper everyone is called unto salvation but only few are chosen to enter in those who were clothed in righteousness and again righteousness is being in right standing with god trusting by faith in the words that he had to say because jesus said that the words that i speak will judge you on judgment day because that they have all come from god what he said is right we have to have faith in it agree in it believe it live it and preach it and in that only will we be found in right standing with god walking in righteousness robed in righteousness that we might enter into the marriage supper of the lamb but there are those who will preach another gospel and another jesus backed up by the power of another spirit that will tell you that you don't have to walk in righteousness you don't have to obey the word of god you can have your garment spotted with sin and still get in do not believe it my friend the holy spirit himself through paul warned you of it the holy spirit's purpose is to make you holy so that he can present you to Christ a spotless bride. Anybody who claims to have the spirit but is not holy, they have a spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will influence you and empower you unto holiness. But beware, because there is another. There's another spirit. There's another gospel. There's another Jesus. And it's there to dirty the bride. Don't be seduced, church. Spend time with the real Holy Spirit and open the word of God that it might wash you and make you white and ready to be counted among the bride. So if the wedding garment is our robes of righteousness, then how do we get this garment? In Ephesians 5, 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So don't tell me that the bride can't be white, that the bride can't be spotless, or that the bride can't be holy. Because right here in Ephesians 25, we are told by the Spirit of the living God that the true bride of Christ is sanctified. She is cleansed by the washing of water by the word of God. She is presented to him a glorious church, not a broken down, powerless, hopeless, helpless, unfaithful harlot of a church. Church, the bride of Christ is full of power. She has no spot and no wrinkle. She is holy and without blemish. This is the church that is presented to Christ. Do you know why Christ has not come yet? Because this is not the church that's waiting for him. Do you know why the great tribulations of the Bible comes? It comes to purify the bride because the church won't purify itself. Because the church will not let go of the worthless, empty chaff of the world. Therefore, does tribulation come to force separation? When the Antichrist comes on the scene, there's no more room to play church. You've got to choose. Do you understand that when wheat is separated from the chaff, it's done by beating the wheat with a tool called the tribulon. It's where we get the modern term tribulation. The purpose in tribulation is to force a separation of the wheat from the chaff, the goats from the sheep, the fruitful from the unfruitful, the fake from the true to purify the church and make it wholly set apart, spotless and without blemish because only those who are true are going to stand for Christ through the tribulation. A people who know who their God is, who have sought God, gotten on their face, learned how to hear himself so that they don't need lights, cameras, smoke, laser shows, props, presentations, and performances to stir up an atmosphere before they'll worship the king. But a people who will get on their knees and be able to hear from heaven and worship whether they're in a palace or a prison cell. My friend, if you need the right kind of music to worship God, you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping music. 
If you need a fancy building to worship God, you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping materialism. If you need air conditioning and cushioned seats to worship God, you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping comfort. If you need a flattering word to worship God, you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping yourself. If your worship is dependent upon a person, a presence, a personality, a performance, or a place, then that is what you're worshiping. But if your worship is based on God and what he has done, you can worship him anywhere. In a prison, in a cell, in a pew, in a field, or like David said, even if you make my bed in hell, still will I worship you. Because he is good, because what he has done warrants worship. If he does nothing more, I will worship the Lord. So my friend, you better get that word in your heart because the Bible says that there is coming a day and in many countries around the world already is and always has been that the word of God will be taken away. And if you don't have that word written in your heart, you will be so easy to lead astray because all you'll have is what they say. You better learn to pray, to seek God's face, to hear from him, and you better know the written word of God enough to be able to confirm whether or not it actually came from him. Because according to Ephesians 5.25, the bride is sanctified by the washing of the water, by the word. Because you see, the Bible says that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Therefore must we be saved by the blood of Jesus, but also we must walk in sanctification. And while salvation comes by the blood, sanctification comes by the word. Which of course Jesus is the word made flesh, so they are one and the same. Therefore do they work together again, two edges of the same two-edged sword, logos and rhema. You can't believe one and not the other. In fact, if we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ, who is the word made flesh, then we must also have faith in every word that is spoken in the word or else we do not truly believe in Jesus, who is the word. Therefore, at salvation, does he wash us with his blood? He atones for us, which then allows us to be filled with his Holy Spirit to go before the throne of grace and be able to hear from him, to search him out and seek him to get that word and to bring the revelation of what is written in his word so that we can be washed by it every day, abiding in it and being changed and cleansed by it so that we can be found spotless at his coming. So you see, because the blood allows for the indwelling Holy Spirit that you might hear God's personal instruction in righteousness. So because of the blood, we are given opportunity to have the word revealed to us that we might then come into agreement and alignment with it that it can change us. Therefore, are we saved by the blood but sanctified by the word? You see that when we read the word and understand the word and continue to abide in faith and right standing in that word, in other words, remain in obedience to it unto the coming of the Lord, or we cleanse by it. In John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are my branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Remember, he says, you will know them by their fruit, whether or not they are abiding in me. In other words, spending that continual time, that drawing from the well, that refilling with the oil, that time in prayer and seeking the Lord and continuously spending that time in his presence that we might produce the fruits of righteousness, which is obedience to his word. It says, for without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. In other words, once you are grafted into Christ, once you are saved by the blood and brought into the family of God, if you do not continue to abide by faith, you are saved because you believed what he said. But as the Holy Spirit begins to bring you through his words in the word and point things out to you, if you do not continue to have faith in what he is saying to you and showing you in the word, Word, then you are no longer abiding in he with him. You're not spending that time. You're not growing. You're not being instructed in righteousness. You will wither up and he will cut you off and cast you to the fire. You will know whether or not they are abiding in his word and his presence, hearing from him and reading his word by the fruits that they produce or the lack thereof. Therefore, in order to be the bride, you must abide relationship. We can't call ourselves his bride if we don't have a personal relationship. If we don't hear from him 
talk to him, submit ourselves to him, obey him, abide with him. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask whatever ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So Jesus is saying here that if my words abide in you, if they continue to indwell you, if you walk in faith in them continually, if you continue to seek me, hear me, and obey me, then I will know that my word abides in you, and you will produce the fruits of righteousness, because you will do what I say is right. And in so doing, you will be counted as my disciples the bride must abide and be sanctified by obedience to his word in john 17 17 in the prayer that christ prayed to the father for us he said father sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth so again i tell you salvation comes by the blood but sanctification comes by the word you must hear from the word you must read the word you must abide in the word continually and have faith in the word that would cause you to obey the word and be changed by the word you will be sanctified purified made white made ready made holy and set apart faithful obedient unto god you will be a pure and spotless bride if you abide in his word and his word abide in you my friend you need to learn your word open the bible read it and believe it live it let it change you agree with it be purified by it pray and seek him get a word from him let him show you pray the prayer that david prayed search my heart O god and see if there be any wicked way in me show me what needs to be cut away grow me today make make me more fruitful make me a pure and spotless bride because we are saved by the blood but we are sanctified by the word though both require faith therefore or we seal saved by faith rhema or logos it's still what he says and faith in it the next characteristic of a true bride of christ is that she has a servant's heart remember that rachel served him she brought water up to him she brought water to all of his camels after having brought up water to the entire flock that was round about her she is willing to labor for others jesus said that the greatest in the kingdom shall be the servant of them all I'm sorry, church, but those that seek vainglory, that seek huge ministries and big platforms, they are not the bride of Christ. Now, is it impossible for God to provide that? No, if he sees fit for it. But let me tell you, if they have sought it, it is not from God. In the Bible, God always blessed those the most who desired it least. Because those were the only ones he knew that he could trust with it. Who wouldn't worship it, but would use it for his glory. In fact, when we read the story of the Tower of Babel, and we see that Nimrod was building this tower up to the heavens. And we've always heard as children that it's because he wanted to be in heaven like God. No, that wasn't the case at all. It was in pride and arrogance. He was trying to put himself in the place of God to be worshipped as God. Because you see the original word there that was translated into tower was Migdal, which literally translates to elevated pulpit. He built himself an elevated pulpit that he might minister to the people and put himself above them in the place of God to be worshipped as God, so that as the congregation of the people gathered, he was receiving the glory and not God. That is a spirit of Antichrist that is not the spirit of the bride. The bride is a servant, seeking ever to serve, not to be served. In fact, Jesus warned the disciples not to be like the Pharisees who always sought the highest seat at parties. They wanted people to think that they were important, that they were somebody. They wanted attention and vainglory. Jesus said, you take the lowest seat always and allow the master to come and pull you from that seat and position you in a higher place that you might be glorified. Because if you position yourself in the high place, at some point the master is going to come and knock you down and you shall be humbled. Therefore are we always warned by God that the humble shall be exalted, but the prideful shall be abased. The Bible says, having clothes and raiment enough, be therewith content, for God knows what you have need of. Church, be careful of any desire to be seen. Yes, ministry requires people to be seen and heard, but if it is your desire to do so, then you are not called, because God will never position someone until first he has stripped that from them. 
Philippians 2 verse 3 says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves, looking not every man on his own things. In other words, not looking for what you want or you need or you feel, but every man also on the things of others. Be concerned about everybody else, not yourself. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. He did not desire to have reputation, but he humbled himself to be a servant until God himself exalted him. This is the mind that was in Christ and this is the mind that is expected in the bride and anything else is not given by the spirit of the living God. It is not preached by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not a representation of the Jesus of the Bible. It is exactly what the Holy Spirit warned us of through Paul. It is another Jesus. It is another gospel. And it is empowered by another spirit. And its purpose is to pollute and seduce the bride so that she is found unready and unfit for her Christ. It says about Christ and being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself. God humbled himself to come and be born in a barn like an animal and led to the slaughter like a lamb. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, the most shameful and painful death known to man. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and of things in earth and of things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ to humble yourself and serve until God himself exalts you. My friend, I've said it before and I'll say it again that when God commissions you, God will also position you. Therefore, if you have positioned yourself, then you have also commissioned yourself. 2 Corinthians 10, 18 says, For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. God knows how to prove his approval of his own. If you feel in any form or fashion that you need to prove yourself, then you are not ready. You need to sit and submit and let God strip all of that chaff away and wait until he exalts you. If he's commissioned you, he will position you. He will go before you. I've seen it in every area of my life. That when he sent me, he went before me and prepared the way. And all I had to do was seek him, get a word, believe what he had to say, walk in obedience in every step that he laid, and the doors opened up before me. Now, does that mean there was no resistance? Of of course there was. When God promises you a land of milk and honey, that means you're going to have to face some bulls and bees to get to it. Of course the enemy opposes. But my friend, though many are the afflictions of the righteous... God delivereth them out of them all. He'll go before you and he will position you. Take the low seat and wait for him to exalt or exalt yourself and prepare yourself for the fall because though he may not do it immediately, eventually he will knock you off your high horse. So humble yourself, seek his face, pray and wait upon the Lord. Because remember that the bride is not showy. Rachel veiled herself. She covered herself. She had great faith. She made herself ready. She dressed herself. She prepared herself for that groom. She wanted to be perfect for him. But in the process, she veiled herself. She was modest. She was chaste. She was not flashy or showy. My friend, the true bride of Christ does not try to catch the eye of the world. The true bride of Christ does not flaunt herself before other lovers. The true bride of Christ is faithful, is ever seeking to better herself in preparation 
for the wedding day for her groom and her groom only. She is ever separating herself more and more and more from those things that would try to seduce her away from that which she is waiting for. She is a pure and faithful and humble and modest bride. This is the bride of Christ. Is this what your church represents? Is this what your ministry represents? Is this what your life represents? Is this what your gospel represents? Is this what the spirit that is leading you pushes you to? The Bible says that the bride adorns herself for her husband. The church makes herself ready. And note that it says that she makes herself ready. Christ has already done all what need be done. It's our job to abide in his words, obey them as a good and faithful bride, and begin to make ourselves ready. What bride, as she gets closer to the wedding day, becomes less and less concerned with her groom or her appearance or herself? Every bride is excited. You're going to diet more. You're going to get your hair fixed. You're going to get your dress in order. As the day approaches, we should be getting more and more excited with eager anticipation that our groom is coming. You see, we have to understand the culture of the time and the way that a Jewish wedding worked in order to understand why God used the wedding analogy so much. Because you see, what would happen is that when a groom and a bride became engaged or betrothed, the groom would often go to the bride's house and they would have a supper, a celebration, and then they would pass a cup around and the bride and the groom would drink from the same cup as a covenant. The drinking of the cup was what we would consider like the signing of a contract. They were making a covenant, a public show that they were betrothed to each other and would be faithful to each other. And it was a covenant for the bride that she would wait for her groom because there was a process that they had to go through. And so at the Last Supper, when the disciples gather around that table and the cup is passed and they all drink from the same cup, the disciples represented the church and the church became espoused to Christ. But after this dinner and celebration, the next thing that would happen is that the groom would go away and the bride would have to stay in her father's house because the groom was going back to his father's house to prepare a place for them. In the culture, families live in communities and the groom would simply build on another room to the father's house, bringing the bride into his family and under the provision and protection of his father. Therefore, all that belonged to the father would belong also to the son and all that belonged to the son would belong to the bride by proxy so that all that belonged to the father would pass through the son to the bride. And so the groom would then go to prepare that place at his father's house and the bride would stay behind and have to wait. She didn't know how long it would take. She would have to wait for that groom to come and she would have to be ready because when he would come, the only warning she would have would be the sound of a trumpet. And so she would gather all of her things and her wedding things and she would go through this time of purification or sanctification in which she would go through ritual washings washed by the water of the word. And as this time went on, she had no communication with the groom. But if there was a communication that needed to be made, it was the best man's job, the Holy Spirit, to bring communication between the groom and the bride-to-be. And it was also the best man's job to keep an eye on the bride and make sure that she was being faithful to the groom and was still worthy to be his bride. If she began to stray, it was the best man's job to go and counsel her and try to bring her back into alignment with the will of the groom. That's why it is the Holy Spirit's job to make you holy so that he can present you a pure and spotless bride without wrinkle, holy unto the Lord. If the word, gift, or manifestation is not geared to driving you towards holiness, it is not coming from the Holy Spirit. It is coming from that other spirit that Paul warned us about. And so then after a time, an undisclosed time, at some point, the groom 
would be finished preparing his place and he would gather his wedding party and he would come and, and it would always be during the night and as they would approach there would be a sound of a trumpet and a shout from the wedding party and excitement would fill the air and the bride would hear it and she would get a rush of anticipation and excitement and joy because that she knew her groom was coming so she would get up and all of her bridesmaids would gather their lamps and their oil and they would get their wedding garments and they would rush out to meet him in the street and he would take her up and they would go in to the marriage supper and so you see my friend christ is coming again and it will be as a thief in the night without warning when you do not expect it will he find you faithful and ready or will he find your dress spotted with the flesh will he find you unfaithful will he find you out of oil will he find that you have been seduced by another lover led astray led away by the things of the world impatient unwilling to wait Jesus is coming back he's not coming back for a showy haughty selfish prideful arrogant self-seeking self-serving attention seeking impure immoral unfaithful compromised filled sin ridden harlot church that was led astray by another gospel for another groom who was close but didn't require the purity or the abiding or the faithfulness he is coming back for a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but is holy and without blemish he is coming back he's coming back for a bride he is coming back for the one who would endure, who would contend for the faith and be sanctified by their submission to the word of the Lord. He is coming back for the bride that would abide and wait by the well. God, I know that it is our place because you have already made the way and you say that you are coming back for the church that makes herself ready. God, I pray that you open our eyes and our ears to understand what that means, that we will take it seriously and know that no man is promised tomorrow, but that we have to be willing to submit and surrender ourselves to you, to your word, to be cleansed by it, to be purged by it, to allow the things of the world to be stripped away, the lust and the pride and the desires thereof that we would be humble that we would have a servant's heart before you that we would make ourselves of no reputation that we might better serve you god i give you praise that you are who you are and that you are coming back for a bride that is pure god we worship you in the beauty of your holiness because you are holy because you are god and god is holy therefore god we surrender to your holy spirit let it pierce our hearts and sanctify us, God, that it might speak to us and reveal to us the truth of your word that we could surrender to it. God, we commit to submit, to abide daily and to hear your words and to come into alignment and agreement with it that we might be changed and purified by it. God, we trust you and we love you and we thank you for your patience and your mercy that you still stand at the door and knock, that you tarry because that you know that we are not ready that the church is anything but a bride to you god but that it should be we pray for the bride god we cry out for the bride we cry out for mercy we cry out for cleansing we cry out for repentance oh god do whatever it is you've got to do to begin to strip away the lies to tear down the compromise to expose that other gospel and that other other Jesus and that other spirit that the Holy Spirit warned us of through Paul. Holy Spirit, we're crying out to you. It is your job to prepare us for the groom. And we ask that you do what you need to do. Come and talk to us. Teach us. Instruct us. Strip us. Tell us what it is that we need to know. Help us to grow and to be made more pure every day. To never think that we're okay or that we've already made it. But that we need to press on and press through until we get to you. Because you're not coming back for us the way 
way we are and you're not satisfied with the way we were but you want a people who will continually contend who will press forward and make themselves ready you want a bride that has eager anticipation and loves you enough to move in dedication to get our dress ready to get our hair ready to get our ourselves ready to ever improve ourselves as we wait for you because that you have given us the tools by your Holy Spirit to do so. God, we surrender to be a people who will be found waiting at the well, who will not let the fire go out, but we'll stir it up every day. We will draw it up. We will abide. We will seek you. We will lay down our pride and stop thinking that we know what to do, but we will cry out to you and say, Lord, speak, speak to me. Give me instruction. Give me direction. Give me correction where it is needed because God, I submit to your leading and I thank you that you were willing to bleed and pour out your very life that I might have the opportunity to become your bride because many are called but few are chosen everyone is given the opportunity but only those who robe themselves in righteousness will be allowed to enter in oh god there are so many that are spotted with sin that think they're gonna be accepted they've been lied to they've been deceived they've been seduced by what their flesh wanted to believe there's been another spirit and they were eager to hear it but I pray by the spirit of the living God today that the spell be broken that the lies be cast down that the vain imaginations be broken down and that the word of the living God come alive and pierce the heart like an arrow that God might have a pure and spotless bride Oh God, I pray that we be jealous for you like you're jealous for us. Raise up the Phineases who would have a zealous indignation for those who come to seduce us away from our husbandmen. God, raise up a people who will speak the truth in love, who will pray and weep and fast between the porch and the altar for the deception that has come upon the bride of Christ, that will be willing to labor, to go out into the streets, to bring others into the marriage supper of the lamb to tell them that he is there and he is reaching out his hand and he is willing to purify you and make you ready for his return but you've got to surrender and submit yourself to his word because that is the only thing that will sanctify that will purify that will light the fire of the holy ghost within you and keep it burning we have to learn to abide God, I pray for a people who will endure because your word says that he who endures till the end shall be saved. Not he who starts and quits. Not he who believes then rejects. Not just him who believes you so he can get out of Egypt, but he who believes you in the wilderness so that he can get into promise. God, I pray for the heart of a servant. I pray against that spirit of materialism that turns the bride into a prostitute. God, I pray exposure on that other spirit that claims to be the Holy Spirit. But all it's doing is causing people to seek after gifts than the giver of gifts. And if all they're coming to you for is for what they can get out of you, then they are not the bride. They are a prostitute. They are no better than Gomer. Oh God, make the people see how much they break your heart when they are not faithful to their God who has given all that he might purchase them and bring them into his father's house that everything that belongs to his father might be hers but she squanders it she doesn't appreciate it she doesn't appropriate it she keeps running back to other lovers who won't cover her they won't protect her they won't provide for her they will turn on her and devour her oh god if the church could only see what i see this counterfeit christianity is gonna leave them so empty it's chaff it's vanity it's not the bride of christ The Holy Spirit will teach you how to be the bride of Christ, but you've got to surrender, submit, and abide. Seek Him. Sit with Him every day and say, I'm willing to learn. What do you want to teach me today? What do you want to show me? What do you want to strip away? What do I need to lose? What do I need to improve? I want to be made better because that I love you. 
I believe you, and I want to be found ready to receive you. Oh God, teach us how to abide and be a purified bride. No compromise, no spots, no excuses, no other lovers, a heart undivided. God, in that place of abiding, give us the instruction that we need as we draw up those deep waters to go out and feed the flocks, to be willing to serve others, to serve the Holy Spirit, that he would find us at the well because you see, my friend, when the servant of Abraham came and Rachel was willing to draw up water for him, she offered, she said, let me draw up water for you and for all of your camels. Let us be willing to serve the Holy Spirit without desire for reward or attention, but simply because we have a servant's heart. Let me draw up water for you and for all of your camels. Even after that, I have drawn it up for myself and for mine, and I'm weary and worn out, still will I labor, still will I serve you, not because I have to, but because I want to, because I have a servant's heart, because that's the kind of bride that God wants for his son. He deserves the best, and we may not have much to offer, but we need to be willing to offer our best. Every last breath for your glory, Lord. I want to be found a bride. God, there is no excuse. You've made a way. You've given us the truth. So today we humble to it. We will pick up the word and use it to be made white. And as any true bride must, we commit to submit and abide. 